the incident that happened at the Two Pines Wedding Chapel that put this whole gory story into motion has since become legend. Hello, contrarians, watchers, listeners, subscribers. Here we are with a warm-up for Volume 2 of Kill Bill. This is... Uh, the, the conclusion of our two-part extravaganza celebrating our 200th episode and uh, I guess celebrating in quotation marks <laughs> Kill Bill Tarantino's uh, I wouldn't even call it a controversial movie it's more like a, a kind of an outlier uh, you know there's yeah. like his early work and then there's his latter work and then there's that little chunk in between that's the kill bills and uh grindhouse maybe i don't even know if it, they're divisive but they're definitely uh maybe they are divisive i was about to say people don't necessarily oh, yeah. agree on their quality the way that they do i mean you can just listen to the episode and learn that the kill bill movies are pretty divisive just amongst three <laughs> the three people. Of us. <laughs> yes the, the sample that we have yeah chess fisher is back on the main feed for this episode, obviously. He started the journey with us. He's going to finish it. So uh, Kill Bill 2, also fresh. So we're going to nitpick it to death on the episode. But here for the warm-up is just, what do you know? Uh, extra Run Tomatoes quotes, extra trivia, and the Josh Gad minute. Let's see if we have a little more, uh, more of an easier time putting Josh Gad in Kill Bill Volume 2 than we did with Volume 1. We'll, we'll see. But first, Alex, more fresh quotes for this 83%, 84% movie? It's, it's just one number below... Uh, 84. 84, so mm -hmm. volume one was 85. Uh, all right, let's start with uh, Terry Lawson from Detroit Free Press, who says, Kill Bill Volume 2 is the movie that makes movie geekdom seem sexy. Is it a sexy movie, Alex? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could apply that logic to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it makes old Hollywood sexy. What is this? Maybe, certainly not me, and I don't think you, but there, there are some people that find Bill in Kill Bill sexy. David uh, Carradine? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's got a powerful voice, and I, I've never, um, like, you know, she wasn't like the Pink Ranger for me or anything, but I know <laughs> Uma Thurman is a, a, a good-looking oh. woman, so... People. Look, I mean, I don't want to go down this path, but Uma Thurman in the Kill Bills is a looker. And that is just me measuring my words. But uh, I've, I've been complimentary of Vivica A. Fox uh, in Independence Day. She's in that <laughs> echelon of hottest a person's ever been in a movie. Uh, but yeah, she was only in the first one. Um, so I guess that doesn't really apply here. In this one, I... And Lucy Liu, obviously, fucking gorgeous. Right, but that's volume one, volume one. Volume two... The, I mean, Michael Madsen. Yeah. <laughs> With the wife beater. Uh, no, there's something about Uma Thurman crawling out of that grave, just covered in dirt, <laughs> but determined to survive. That, that just kind of hot. And, uh, and, and Chaz, I mean, Chaz, he said that he found Bill charming. He totally understood what the bride saw in him. So maybe. Uh, maybe that's what this guy is saying. That's, that's where he's coming from. Next, uh, Chris Peepus from culturevulture.net says, Volume 2 upends expectations in humorous ways, but it also offers more of what audiences anticipate from a Tarantino movie. Um, is this what audiences anticipate from a Tarantino movie? Especially what they anticipated back in 2004? That might be like a retrospective <laughs> review, because that's... I mean, the talking, there's more talking in this movie. We The first one's more that. violent than this one. Yeah. Like, I mean, this one features an, an eye plucking. Yeah, but the first one had to make an entire sequence black and white to avoid getting an NC-17 rating. So, um, all right. Oh, could also mean, like, because this one's way more dialogue heavy. That's what I'm thinking. A lot, a lot yeah. more talking. It's also longer. It goes over two hours in the... Uh, Way meaner towards women than the first one. <laughs> yes. He's <Yeah>. back. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Jackson shows up for a little bit. It's yes. not a Tarantino movie unless Sam Jackson uh, shows up. He's not in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, right? No. Well, there you go. I was trying to remember if he does a voiceover or anything at any point, but you know who is? Timothy Oliphant. 
Yeah. <laughs> Replacing Sam Jackson. <laughs> The white Sam Jackson, <laughs> Timothy Oliphant. <laughs> All right. Next, John Beefus from Commercial Appeal, Memphis, Tennessee, says, If Volume 1 was pure cinema, composed entirely of pulp dreams, Volume 2 finds the bride awakening to the consequences of something approximated the real world. It's not the real world, but... <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it could be uh, closer to the real world in the Tarantino sense, right? And maybe that 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 explains, or is a way of uh, rationalizing something that we had issues with, without getting too into it, right? But in the episode, all of us couldn't help but bring up how she was such a badass, the bride, such a badass in Kill Bill One, and then mm -hmm. in Kill Bill Two, she's just a punching bag, and. Yep. That could be because Kill Bill 2 takes place in the real world, and so she's not a superhero. Now she's extremely fallible. Yeah, she also is plucking eyeballs out and shit. But <laughs> I think you have to work a little bit harder than that. Yeah, I mean, pay Who's me. To say, though? Pai Mei, Pai Mei, like... Pai Mei. Pai Mei, he's not somebody that exists in the real world. Maybe that's why his scenes look different, you know? They have the other world... <laughs> Filter. Could be. I, I could be. <laughs> Fission versus fusion, man. Okay, so I'm just quickly going through the Tarantino filmographies, uh, filmography and, and his movies, and I guess his real-world movies are more on the second half of his career, right? Hollywood, uh, Django, Glorious Bastards, and uh, yeah, and Glorious Bastards very grounded in reality. I mean, up to when it differs from reality, but up till then, it's it's yeah. You know, World War Two really happened. Hitler is a real person. Wouldn't Jackie Brown be his most real world movie? Yes, but even he would say at the time that that was just him ahead of the curve. Yeah, yeah, we talk about that in the episode. Um, yeah, that and. Yeah, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood such a fun, like, almost anecdotal movie. It's just a series of, like, anecdotes that this happened and this happened. Yeah, but, again, th this trilogy here that he put together, the two Kill Bills and Death Proof. Death Proof, yeah. I think these are the most definitive out-of-the-real-world movies that he made, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, Pulp Fiction, I mean... Depending on what you believe is in that suitcase. Correct. And, you know, it yeah. could be supernatural or it could be just diamonds. We're going to close with Audrey Rock Richardson from Tool Transcript Bulletin, Utah, who says, I am left hoping in vain for volume three. And this is something that we didn't talk about at all in the episode. And uh, the idea that uh, volume, three ha volume three has been floated around like... The, the, teased by Tarantino and uh, speculated about by fans. Uh, I don't know who at some point said that volume three would be about uh, Vivica Fox's daughter, all grown up, going after the bride, which, I mean, I guess I you could make like the I've heard that before. Do, do we talk about that in the episode? Because I feel like I've heard that before. Uh, we didn't. We didn't. I, I kept meaning to bring it up, but we had so many other things to talk about that we just it just didn't come up. But I'll, I'll say this. I don't need volume three. I think that the story ends at the end of volume two. And I don't need yeah, anything and else. And not just that, but like in the 20 years that have passed since these movies, Tarantino's definitively proven he's like a better filmmaker than this. Which, of course, if he was here right now, and if Quentin is watching, <laughs> God bless you, he would probably say like, we talk about this extensively in the episode. It's clear he has a really good time making this and this is kind of the stuff he would uh, he probably wants to do. I mean, well, isn't this the thing that his next movie is his last movie? Isn't that the word on the street? Uh, allegedly. I mean, that is... I mean, I mean, we just lost Terry Funk within the past year, and if there's someone I could see fashioning themselves after Terry Funk, it's Quentin Tarantino in the sense of having a retirement match and then <laughs> getting back bored. at it six months later. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but that's... Look, if he's a more mature filmmaker now, which he is... I think that that would actually make me want to watch Volume 3 because I'd be like, okay, how much more different it's going to be from the previous two. Hey, I'd, I'd rather see another Django than like another. I agree. Hillbill. I agree. Okay. I want to see a Star Trek. <laughs> but I if... want to see his Halloween and his 
Friday the 13th okay, also. T- talk about ships that have sailed. <laughs> I, mean... I don't even know if those ships were ever going to pull into port to begin with. I think they just like went by, you know, someone from the, <laughs> the pier like, hey, waved at them. I, I don't need volume three. I would watch volume three if it was directed by Tarantino. I mean, yes. I'll watch whatever movie he makes That's... next. I'm going to watch it. He's in that category. We've talk, we talk about this in the episode. I'm going to watch whatever he makes. I just would prefer it's not another Kill Bill movie. Right. If he announces, okay, my last movie is the the return to the Kill Bill world. It's a biopic on Terry Funk. <laughs> <laughs> well, because he's had those other, right, uh, for years and years. It's finally been debunked because there's no way that you could make it happen. But he was talking about the, the Vega Brothers prequel, yeah. right? Like yeah. the Mr. Blonde and Vincent Vega having the time of their lives in Europe or wherever. I'm like, okay, well, unless he completely, you know, he recasts those roles or he CGI's the hell out of Madsen and Travolta, <laughs> that's just not going to happen. And uh, there was also, uh, he floated the idea of, of a prequel with uh, Brett Pitt's adventures before Inglorious Bastards. Yeah, I guess I remember that. Yeah, so... I think it's like a choose your own adventure as far as like which Tarantino project would you like him to to tackle next if he's going to go back to that to one of his wells. Yeah, if he's o- if he's operating under the assumption that this next movie is his last, I imagine it's going to be something original. I well, there's already so. been like rumors about casting and shit like that too and some about it being like about a film critic or something. I don't know. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. It might be called the film critic. Or maybe that's the, the working title. John uh, Lovitz is the <laughs> <laughs> the titular character. Um, Look, he's, yeah, ha- he's gonna have that... he's gonna have DiCaprio, Pitt, Jackson, bring Travolta back. Oh yeah, patch things up with Uma Thurman. I don't know about that. <laughs> Talking about ships that have sailed. Um, I saw some headline, and I, I at this point, I never know what to take seriously when it comes to movie news. But it said like Shane Gillis was in talks to be in it. And it's like, yep, that that sounds on the money for something Tarantino would do for his next movie. So, is that a wrestler, so. Shane Gillis? Yeah, he's like the stand-up comedian of the moment right now. He's funny. Thank he's you. more funny just like in conversation, like than he is. Eh. <laughs> What's the deal with cheese? You know that type of thing. <laughs> What's the deal with uh, David Carradine and Kill Bill Two? <laughs> All right. Well, let us know what what your preference is. Let's. Obviously, we all, I think that any Tarantino fan would prefer he goes out, if he's going out, goes out with an original. But if he's going to go back to the well, do you want the Kill Bill sequel? The the Vega Brothers prequel? Which would be animated at this point. <laughs> or uh, uh, the, the Inglorious Bastards prequel? What else? Give me the Mr. Pink sequel from Reservoir Dogs. Like his his time in the clink. You know, he gets, he gets I trust Tarantino to give me something fresh and dope. Yeah. Buscemi needs to go back to the Tarantino verse. Buscemi, Christoph Waltz, of course, he's got the season pass there. Uh, he's one of the guys that got an Oscar through Tarantino's stuff, so Yeah, you know, he's he's kind of uh low as far as uh actresses, so he needs to build up that that's stable. Without Uma Thurman, I don't think that he has many recurring characters. Julia Sweeney, maybe? Bring her back from uh, oh, Jesus. Fiction. <laughs> Deep um, cut. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. That's a anyway. Good call. He's very good about know. crafting iconic female characters, but not in retention. <laughs> yes. Retention has gone down in the Tarantinoverse. Uh, so let us know, what would you prefer? Uh, which of his prequels? And if you're going to you know, fall back on the original, well, then you're not playing because we're playing the prequel sequel game. So that's it, Alex. Before we go to trivia, uh, the Josh Gad Minute is upon us. Where do we put Josh Gad in Kill Bill, Kill Bill Volume 2? Um, I mean, the obvious answer for just offensive comedy is make him Pai Mei. Um, and the the reason we can even put that on the table is because Quentin Tarantino originally saw himself playing Pai Mei. Right. Um, but just m- mostly to pop you, I figured the best use of him would be uh, he could play Esteban and replace Michael <laughs> Parks because that seemed to be one of your biggest points of contention with the movie was Michael Parks's, um 
rendition, his interpretation of yes. the Esteban character. Yeah, I think that uh, Michael Parks believes that everybody in Brazil speaks very, very slowly because his character is Brazilian, right? Like I think Chad said that his character was Brazilian, so I'm assuming he knows what he's talking about. I'll, I'll take Chaz's word for it. You can do that, or you can do... You would have to cast a different actress, though, to make her a bit younger, but uh, he could be the Reverend at the beginning. Oh. <laughs> the church. Well, okay. Then why isn't he the, the groom? Just get uh, Th- that's Seth my... Rogen out of there and put the gad. The Academy Award winner? What's that cat's name? We oh, can't yeah. discover this in real time. He's like uh, a stunt man and... Makeup. Makeup, makeup. There yeah. you go. You you don't believe? Oh, okay. You you just wouldn't buy Josh Gad as marrying Uma Thurman, is that it? No, my biggest thing is like if we have a chance to use Josh Gad in a Tarantino movie, it should be something that. That's why I stick by the Esteban thing. He should be like greasy and weird and have like a weird dialect and um, you know, that, like an individualistic dialect. Because that's if you want Josh Gad in a Tarantino movie, do you want him to just be like the innocent guy that gets mowed down in the beginning? <laughs> gotta get gotta get the most bang for your buck. Okay, well, well, if you want the most bang, and Alex, when we did the last warm up, you hadn't watched Volume Two yet. He's not so... replacing Michael Madsen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's just you being nice to Michael Madsen. But l- let's say that in this alternate reality, Michael Madsen, he's he's got steady work. He doesn't depend just on Tarantino movies to keep going. It's not his nut. <laughs> yeah, uh, wouldn't you want to see Josh Gad as this bouncer at a strip club that also? Has this sadistic side to him. And then he gets I, I bit mean, by the snake. Or he could be uh, the strip club manager. Oh, there you the go. The guy who just completely, like, emasculates Michael Madsen and takes his, all his shifts off the board and shit. You could do that, too. I'll tell you who he won't replace. He will not replace Tid Hay. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> all right. So, strip club uh, manager or uh, Esteban. That I'll tell you the improvement is Esteban. I just don't think that Esteban that that scene is a drag, and Josh Gad would make it lively. So there you go. That's your Josh Gad minute. Now let's go to trivia. Kill Bill Volume Two, of course, written and directed by Quentin Tarantino, released on April sixteenth of two thousand four, as we talk about in the episode. Uh, just a little over a six month turnaround uh, after Kill Bill Volume One was released as. Discussed in Kill Bill Volume 1. Tarantino wanted to make this four-hour epic. The compromise was make two movies. Budget of $30 million for box office return of a little bit over $150 million. Didn't make as much as Volume 1, but still, I mean, that's fucking triple your budget. Or not triple, five times your budget there. It was nominated for three different awards at the 2005 MTV Movie Awards. (laughs) Best movie, best female performance, and best fight. Which fight is that? It is the fight between Daryl Hannah and Uma Thurman. So if you had to guess out of those three, which one do you think it took home? Uh, best female character is Uma Thurman, right? Yes. Okay. And what was the first one? Best movie. It didn't get best movie. Uh, <laughs> what a lineup here, too. Uh, <laughs> and this is worth calling out here, is that the word was Kill Bill Volume 2 was the first screener that went out to like members of the press that award, and... Uh, to members of like the Academy and the press at the award season. And it did get nominated for anything at the Academy Awards. Man. Not saying that it should have. It's just like, I can see Tarantino just, you know, under the cover of darkness at night with the big, <laughs> big manila envelope with all the screener copies in it. Just like going house to house. <laughs> uh, all right. But back to 2005 and the MTV movie awards, which were hosted by Jimmy Fallon. Not <laughs> much has changed in our society. I'll tell you what, sadly. Eminem performed Mariah Carey, Yellow Card, and Foo Fighters. And I remember watching this because Foo Fighters did Best of You, and it was a really good uh, performance. Uh, and this also is, for some reason, I think the second or third time I've brought this up in Contrarian's history. That's the year that Rachel McAdams and Ryan Gosling won Best Kiss. Oh, yeah. You and they, like, it. met on stage in a oh. – if you don't know what I'm talking about, just <laughs> Google 2005 MT Movie Awards – Gosling McAdams, but best movie it did not win. Um, so that takes us down to best female character or best fight. I'm guessing it won best fight, although I would have given it to Uma Thurman for best female performance. It did win best fight. Uma Thurman versus Daryl Hannah uh, beat out 
Brad Pitt versus Eric Bana from Troy. Um, <laughs> Zhang Zihi versus the Emperor's Guards from House of Flying Daggers. And seen. the Battle of the News teams from the original Anchorman. Aww. Best female performance, not character, as I erroneously spoke earlier. Uh, Uma Thurman did lose out. She was nominated alongside Natalie Portman for Garden State, uh, Rachel McAdams for The Notebook, Hilary Swank for Million Dollar Baby, and they all lost out to it's 2005 Julio. You know what's coming. Uh, Lindsay Lohan as Katie Heron in oh. Mean Girls. Well played. That's an honorable loss. And then best movie, man, the Academy really fucked up this year. They got it all wrong. <laughs> Kill Bill, Spider Man Two, Ray, The Incredibles, all lost out to Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> I am so glad Garden State is not among those nominees. That would have made me a little angry. Zach Braff did not get a male performance nomination. <laughs> he got a nomination for Breakthrough Male. Uh, which John Hedder won for Napoleon Dynamite. What what breakthrough? He was in 20 seasons of uh, <laughs> Scrubs. It's breaking through to the big screen. This is back when they were trying out different things. We, we've talked about in Contrarian's history the um, infamy and kind of unbelievably fun way their Lifetime Achievement Award came to an end with Glenn oh, yeah. Howard. Uh, but they had like a new award at that point called the Generation Award that year that went to Tom Cruise. And then the Silver Bucket of Excellence, which I guess was like the MTV Criterion Collection, <laughs> they inducted uh, The Breakfast Club that year. Um, it's not a very MTV movie. Brother, we've talked about this before, man. <laughs> like, people don't know. Those used to be like a real event. Like, all these actors that I've named were there. Like, you know, it was. Tom real Cruise story. showed up. <laughs> He probably, you know, submitted in his video where he was yeah. on, you know, climbing a fucking mountain somewhere. Um, I'm trying to see here who presented best fight. Dwayne the Rock Johnson. We can't escape. <laughs> we can't escape this shit. So he went up there and said, you know, Uma Thurman, Daryl Hannah, get your ass up here. <laughs> All right. So we talk about Pi May and we talk about how Tarantino wanted to play him. Somewhere in the process where he abandoned playing him, he came up with the idea that he was going to have Pai Mei lip-speaking Cantonese while his voice would be in English, imitating a bad dub job of, like, kung fu movies of the past, in which Tarantino was going to provide the voiceover. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I was with you until you got there. <laughs> in the end, Tarantino abandoned this idea. And uh, Pai Mei, who is uh, Chai Hu Lu, uh, speaks his own voice. I don't think we... I kind of save that for this, because in the episode, you, myself, and Chaz go deep into Tarantino being very far up his own ass. And that's like a, <laughs> a great example of something that you can just see him thinking about. And then like, fuck it, it's not going to work. Or, or do you think there's somebody that's the voice of reason, just hiding in the shadows? Somebody that every now and then pulls him back. I was like, no, man, <laughs> please don't. <laughs> this will end you. And and he listens. But, you know, that person is never, he's like the Dick Cheney, uh, of you know, just operating from Jeez. behind the scenes, <laughs> saving Tarantino from himself. That is, that is wild. That is, a, like, I get it. But that's a joke that we come up with. While talking That's, about Kill Bill, not something that you do while you're making Kill Bill. Yeah. <laughs> Did he ever consider And that even it? for like Tarantino, that's like um, Harold and Kumar 2. There's that scene that's not very politically correct in which Ed Helms says he's a translator for. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, I think I remember now. Yeah, the Harold's parents, and he does a very, very offensive Asian imperson impersonation. And that's. I can just see Tarantino, you know. Doing like Mickey Rooney shit in the 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 studio, and then like yeah, and everyone's like no. Uh, Uma Thurman and Daryl Hannah did not get along with each other, and reportedly instructed hotel and cinema staff to ensure that they were kept separate from each other during the press tour for Volume One. They were again at odds at the film screening at the Cannes Film Festival, and ordered separate areas to be created at the after show party so they wouldn't clash. When the two women won Best Fight at the 2005 MTV Movie Awards, only Daryl attended. Uma's absence was conspicuous, considering she had gone to the previous year 
to collect the award for her fight with uh, Chi Chiakai Kurayama in Volume 1. So, her golden popcorn bucket's in the mail. <laughs> Man, that is sad. Uh, those people, and I say this with love, maybe even admiration, but they live in a different world. Can you imagine not getting along with someone and just saying, you know what? I want my own space. <laughs> you create a completely different area for that person. There are plenty of people I have worked with professionally that I do not like. Julio, you're not one of them. Um, <laughs> but that's what that is, is a position of privilege where you get to do shit like that. You and myself, I know you've worked with people you don't like either. We worked together with people we didn't like. And right. that's not a luxury we have. Like, you know, when you're doing work work, not fucking making <laughs> movies, you have to get along with these people. Now, with that said, if I was ever in a position of celebrity or privilege like that, I would absolutely do shit like that. I've talked about that for the entire run of this podcast. If I was <laughs> in, I would be Liam Gallagher. I would be, you know, uh, Uma Thurman or Daryl Hannah here. I would be that level of petty. But, okay, uh, but how, how does Daryl Hannah win? that that competition why is she the one at mtv movie awards and not uma thurman is it just because uma thurman got to go the previous year or <laughs> that i don't know i would assume it's something like daryl hannah's like well, fuck it i'm going and uma thurman you know <laughs> <laughs> clinton's like uma baby it's the mtv movie awards <laughs> you only get one of these in your life <laughs> The brothel segment where the bride meets Esteban was the last scene of the movie to be shot. It was filmed at a Mexican brothel and all of the female extras were sex workers that worked there. I bring this up, Julio, kind of in closing, as it is your least favorite scene in the movie. So I'm just thinking of you somehow in a different timeline being involved in this and just being miserable for the last few days of shooting that this was the last <laughs> scene you had to do. Just hating every minute. Just cursing Michael Parks' name. <laughs> Uh, I mean, the sex workers part doesn't surprise me. That seems like something that why not? You're already there. Bring authenticity. Yeah, yeah, yeah but they don't really. I mean, here's the thing: it, it's that is literally like a trivia bit because it doesn't change the movie mm -hmm. at all. Like it could be just random people that they grab from the street, and you wouldn't know. There's no nudity, right? That, that I remember. I mean, it's just women walking in the background. Yeah. yeah, they're just, it's implied they're prostitutes or whatever. Right. So. The only reason you know is because uh, there's that Uma Thurman voiceover leading you into the, the scene that kind of sets the tone. But right, that's, I mean, that's fine. That's 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 another story that you just tell your friend. It's like, remember how Tarantino wanted to do the voice of Pai Mei? Well, he also wanted actual sex workers. <laughs> and he got that one. So, sure. Why not? I don't want to say he got paid well. But that's all that matters. Uh all right. Well, that's that's Kill Bill Volume Two. That's I mean, as far as this yeah. video goes, yeah. The the episode itself, th there's plenty more, and there's a third voice. Chaz comes back, and we we talked. Alex thought that he'd seen this movie. Turns out that he hadn't. Nope. So it was a first time watch, and uh, I hadn't seen it since it came out because I don't own it, and uh, and Chaz couldn't help himself when he watched the movie, like as soon as we were done with Volume One. So. Three very different perspectives. Uh, but that's it. Check out uh, our episode and then get ready because we're closing the month of March with uh, a return to wrestling. We're going to do the movie Fighting with My Family. It's a preparation for the upcoming WrestleMania. We'll try to do this. <laughs> that Paige is in no way involved in. But the producer the and one of the cameos in the movie is... Uh, has a very big role in the upcoming WrestleMania. Yeah, well, there you go. There you go. So watch Fighting With My Family. Watch Kill Bill Volume 2, Volume 1 as well. Probably already did if you are doing these episodes in order. And uh, check out the, the podcast. So uh, we'll be back with a warm-up for Fighting With My Family. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And we'll talk to you again soon.